Welcome to Silmarillion chat number four. I'm going to talk about chapters five to eight of the Quintus Silmarillion, which is the central book or, or story of this big collection of stories by J.R.R. Tolkien. And uh, this is the pre-Lord of the Rings Hobbit history of Middle-earth. Uh, particularly the Quinta is the, the story of the first age after the creation of the world and the things that happen with elves coming from Middle-earth to the land of the Valar, the sort of semi-godlike creatures, and then their return. And the chapters we've got today are five of Eldemar and the Princes of the Odalier, of Feanor, this number six, and the Unchaining of Melkor, seven of the Silmarils and the Unrest of the Noldor, and eight of the Darkening of Arnor. And the big emphasis here, I think, is we've got a, a plot advance, certainly, uh, but it, we've got a big emphasis here on um, the elves. We are moving more and more now, really decisively, towards non-Valar, non-godlike creatures being the main characters of the story. The Anilindale Anil and the Valaquenta, the first two uh, independent stories, which is about the, the creation of the world and the great music of the Ainur, and the Valaquenta is the list of the, the, the Valar, the angels, both the senior angels, the Valar themselves, and the junior angels, the Maya. Then the Quinta is the tale of the Silmarils, and uh, we start with, I oh, talked about this last time, we have some chapters, we still have quite important stuff about the Valar, the beginning of days of Aule and Yavanna, um, of the coming of the elves and the captivity of Melkor. So we hear about Melkor is a Valar, and of Thingol and Melian. Melian is a Maya. But we see in chapter 3, elves, 4 of Thingol. Thingol is an elven king. The introduction of this more kind of mortal, you know, at, that is to say non-angelic, can be killed in ordinary form. Uh, race who, who turn up there and they're children of Eru the high god rather than creations of the Valar in Aloy and Yavanna we hear about creations of other races the dwarves the eagles and the ents um, by uh, by Valar but now three of our four chapters are about the elves none mention directly any Valar other than Melkor the big bad um, and the, the darkening of Valinor implicates everyone involved but we now have the Noldor particularly becoming the um, the main characters of the story and other elves as well throughout will come in particularly the the Sindar under their King Thin Thingol. I really enjoyed this section I in a big thing I liked was the characterization I think the characterization is is very efficient everything he does in the Silmarillion is very efficient um, when you understand it's saga and myth rather than novel, it, it's prose, but a novel is a particular form of prose. It's not that every fiction in prose is, is a novel, otherwise every short story would be a novel. The point is things have different forms, and here the form is myth and saga, and there is this kind of elliptical, concise uh, form uh, that both sort of just comes round things it doesn't sort of spend lots of detail on things but also is very um, kind of very concentrated uh, a really interesting mixture and a big thing he does well there amongst other things there's lots of beautiful phraseology um, and just uh, you, you, just at the end of chapter five of Eldemar and the Princes of El the Eldalier uh, we hear um, that well it's about Kelegorm learning the the knowledge of birds and beasts and their tongues of all living things that are or have been in the kingdom of Arda save only the fell and evil creatures of Melkor lived then in the land of a man and there were many other creatures that have not been seen upon middle earth and perhaps never now shall be since the fashion of the world was changed and there's so much implied and gestured at in that including the fashion of the world being changed which I don't think we've heard before uh, so we get new information in the last uh, phrase the last clause of a chapter and uh, we also kind of get this idea of well that's where all animals lived in this Edenic paradise of the gods uh, but also remarkable things we don't know about and, and you get you, you, you might have come to mind unicorns or whatever else 
this sense of of wonders lost wonders very tolkienian uh, but wonders but another another thing he does is i mean in general he he does well at uh um very quickly summing up story and setting um with this mythical tone which is different to lord of the rings it's parallel there's an echo and even in the hobbit uh, but the formality is at its highest in the Silmarillion and its concision is at the highest. The memory of Middle-earth under the stars remained in the hearts of the Noldor and they abode in the Kalkiria and in the hills and valleys within the sound of the Western Sea. And though many of them went often about the land of the Valar, making far journeys in search of the secrets of land and water and all living things, yet the peoples of Tuna and Alqualonde drew together in those days. Finway was king in Tyrion, and Olway and Alqualonde, but Ingwe was ever held the high king of all the elves. He abode thereafter at the feet of Manwe upon Tanaquatil. Incredibly poetic, resonant, uh, very careful phrasing. Um, so you're, it's it's an aural feast, uh, but we also learn um, important things about Ingwe and the Vanyar's closeness to the Valar. Um, the separation, the partial separation, because the Calcaria is the, the pass between the lands, basically, um, in the Blessed Land, in the sub-regions. Um, the, the closeness between the seagoing Teleri elves and the uh, crafty Noldor. That Finway is the king. Um, we then come, uh, uh, and this is what I was going to come to, this, so we've got these, very, that's a couple of very good examples, I think, but then also characters built very quickly. And um, the uh, in chap chapter six, the noontide of the blessed realm, the fullness of its glory and its bliss, long in tale of years, but in memory too brief. Uh, the elves grow up and come up with letters, the uh, runes of Rumil, initially. And uh, Natan was born in Eldamar in the house of the king in Tyrion upon the crown of Tuna, the eldest of the sons of Finhwë and the most beloved. Cura Finwë was his name, but by his mother he was called Feanor, spirit of fire. And thus he is remembered in all the tales of the Noldor. And we have a, a very a, a, a biblical Old Testamental patriarchal story, um, or rather an echo of one, with Miriel dying not long after childbirth, relatively speaking, being the first to die in all the blessed land. Uh, Feanor has consumed her spirit. And... Um, yeah, she she goes to sleep, but her spirit departs from her body to go and go to the halls of Mandos. Finwë is in sorrow, and nothing can comfort him. Uh, and so, all his love he gave thereafter to his son, and Feanor grew swiftly as if a secret fire was kindled within him. He was tall and fair of face and masterful. His eyes piercingly bright, his hair raven dark. In the pursuit of all his purposes, eager and steadfast. Few ever changed his courses by counsel, none by force. He became of all the Noldor, then or after, the most subtle in mind and the most skilled in hand. And, and it goes on. Uh, this, is, this is not characterisation developed via characters reacting to a series of events, an arc in their character where they must face trial and develop. And that, generally speaking, is not how Tolkien works in the Silmarillion. We do see that in Lord of the Rings. We don't see that in the Silmarillion because the form is different, because it's it's saga. So instead, saga front loads detail often. You hear much about characters, including hints of their doom um, and hints of what is to come. Uh, we know the noontide is nearly over and Feanor appears... Um, and we hear all about his craftiness that he marri and that he marries the daughter of the great smith Martin and Martin teaches him much. Um, we do then hear that Finway takes a second wife and this is going to create uh, one of the core tensions of the Quenta. Um, one of the core tensions of the Quenta is not between uh, Melkor and the elves but between the elves and the elves and the things that come about due to um, yeah the clashes between parts of the elven families um, amongst particularly amongst the Noldor and um, with Noldor and others and here we have one of the, really the first instance of that uh, with Finway marrying a Vanya the 
close kin. Uh, this is um, Indus, close king of Inque, the high king, golden haired and tall and in all ways unlike. Miriel. Finway loved her greatly, was glad again, but the shadow of Miriel did not depart. He has two more sons, Fingolfin and Finafin. Um, Finafin is going to be very important to us because he is the father of Galadriel. So Galadriel is the granddaughter of the the first leader and high king, first high king of the Noldor. They keep working, the noontide was drawing to its close while the sons of Indus grew to their full stature. Uh, there is a, a, a point here again which we're, it, this is the front loading and this is a technique we're, we're, we'll see regularly. In those unhappy things which later came to pass in which Feanor was the leader Many saw the effect of this breach between within the house of Finway, judging that if Finway had endured his loss and been content with the fathering of his mighty son, the courses of Feanor would have been otherwise, and great evil might have been prevented. For the sorrow and the strife in the house of Finway is graven in the memory of the Noldorin elves. That's an interesting thing again, isn't it? That we're just told there's going to be great sorrow. There's this this breach we see between. Um, that, that Feanor isn't pleased about his father's remarriage and he's not uh, particularly loving of Fingolfin and Finnefin. Um, he prefers to go everywhere else and deal with stuff. He, he ha doesn't get over the, the death of his mother because his father doesn't get over the death of his mother. Uh, which is a fairly, I mean, obvious but also subtle psychological point. And by, in, in the sense that it is... Um, well observed it's something where Feanor becomes more real to us in this very swift passage when we're, we're not told all the conversations he has with people so we know that he is sad but we get that and we understand it's going to cause doom at Melkor return it comes again and sues for pardon um and uh, Nieno aids his prayer, but Mandos was silent. Mandos, of course, sees the future and knows this is not a good idea, necessarily. Uh, there's a point here with Manwe that, uh, Ma uh, sorry, yeah, Manwe grants the pardon. He's the king of the gods. Melkor seems wise and kind, and though Mandos, who has sight of the future, doubts him, Manwe, we're told, was free for evil and could not comprehend it. And he knew that in the beginning, in the thoughts of Iluvatar, Melkor had been even as he. And he saw not the depths of Melkor's heart, and did not perceive that all love had departed from him for ever. But Ulmo was not deceived, and Tulkas clenched his hands whenever he saw Melkor his foe go by. For if Tulkas is slow to wrath, he is slow also to forget. But they also obeyed the judgment of Manwe, for those who would defend authority against rebellion must not themselves rebel. Uh, but Tolkien is in some ways surprisingly undidactic. He's very didactic, really, um, and most authors are uh, deep down. But very rarely do we have such a clear rule. But here, again, the saga format allows Tolkien to just say core to the truth of who these people are, these gods are, um, is that they cannot rebel against Manwe because that would be to undermine the thing they protect. This is relevant because of the uh, alienation of Feanor from other elves and, and what's going to happen with the Noldor. And Melkor hates it, just the hatred he has. He hates the elves. Um, the Vanyar are suspicious of him. They love the, they grow in the light, they, they dwelt, dwelt in the light of the trees, they're content. The Teleri, he thought they were idiots, tools too weak for his design, but the Noldor listened to him and some hearkened. Um, and here comes a really interesting thing where we learn about, so some, they don't listen to Melkor in terms of his active corruption uh, in fact they never will listen to that thing that he says but he will stoke their resentment certainly um this is should if we know about the broader history of middle earth call us forward to sauron in his many guises as uh, prisoner of our pharazon on numenor and as the tanatar the gift giver in region you know this this figure of fair seeming corruption but here, here's the, an interesting thing that, again, we have this excellently concise in a couple of, really only a couple of sentences within all these pages, summary of who Feanor is. Melkor indeed declared after that Feanor had learned much art from him in secret and had been instructed by him the greatest of all his works. But he lied in his lust and his in envy, for none of the Aldalier ever hated Melkor more than Feanor, son of Finway, 
who first named him Morgoth. And snared though he was in the webs of Melkor's malice against the Valar, he held no converse with him, and took no counsel from him, for Feanor was driven by the fire of his own heart only, working ever swiftly and alone, and he aided the aid, he asked the aid and sought the counsel of none that dwelt in a man, great or small, save only, and for a little while, of Nervenel the wise, his wife. It's terribly sad, impressive, and fearful, because that sort of genius destroys, uh, inevitably, always. Uh, but it's a point that comes up again uh, later, as uh, in, in the next chapter in, of the Silmarils and the Unrest of Noldor, I think it is, where Melkor seeks to tempt Feanor um, to do with, you know, he's trying to say, oh, we've got a, a lie and because the Valar are after the Silmarils that we've made. And this oversteps the bound because Feanor suddenly realises, ah, he's up to something. Feanor is um, almost immune to the sort of that petty corruption. He has too great a spirit, a spirit of fire. Uh, and there's a comparison, actually. The Noldor are the, the chosen elves of Aule. They're really close to the craft god. Who also makes the dwarves. And Feanor, in this, um, and in the relationship he's about to have over the Silmarils, and that's going to lead to such events in the future, particularly for his sons, um, he, um, he, like the dwarves, like Thor and Oakenshield with the Arkenstone, uh, cannot be corrupted the straight way, can't be offered power, like the dwarves, because the dwarves, uh, the, their rings work on them corruption, not via uh, making them want power, which is, I, I guess, and, and, and things like that, which is the, the corruption of the nine rings, but the seven uh, allow you to accumulate wealth, not power, uh, but also tithe that wealth, and so Thorin, though he doesn't even bear the ring, um, his almost that the kind of natural bent and natural path of corruption is for so wanting the thing back, the Arkenstone, that it leads to, to tragedy. And um, here you have a similar thing with Feanor. Feanor has a downfall and doom appointed him, but he can't be corrupted by just going in and only stoking sort of private jealousies or, or seeking political advantage with him. The great work of Feanor is the Silmarils, but not until the end when Feanor shall return, who pirate perished ere the sun was made again, spoilers, we're told it straight up, and sits now in the halls of awaiting and comes no more among his kin. Not until the sun passes and the moon falls shall it be known of what substance the Silmarils were made. He makes these incredible gems, the inner fire of them where they glow. Um, <laughs> Yet, yet the crystal was to the Silmarils, but as is the body to the children of Iluvatar, the house of its inner fire that is within it and yet in all parts of it and is its life. What a wonderful picture. And the inner fire of the Silmarils who made from the blended light of the trees of Valinor, which lives in them yet, though the trees have long withered and shine no more. The Silmarils become so important uh, because, and um, we're now being told the trees are going to be dead, because the trees die and the trees are this essentially perfect work of light and art on the part of Yavanna and, and I, I, guess, I suppose Nyanna as well. Therefore, even in the darkness of the deep, deepest treasury, the Silmarils of their own radiance shone like the stars of Vada. And yet, in, as they were indeed living things, or as were they indeed living things, they rejoiced in light and received it and gave it back in hues more marvellous than before. Vada hallowed them, so thereafter no mortal flesh, nor hands unclean, nor anything of evil will might touch them, but have scorched and withered. And Mandos foretold that the fate of Arda lay locked within them. The heart of Feanor was fast bound to these things he himself had made. And Melkor lusts for them. Uh, this is an interesting point that came up in our discussion on the Discord. That Melkor doesn't like Varda. He, he hates Varda. Elbereth ever after scares his servants. The very name of, of Varda, the, the Lady of the Stars. Uh, but... Um, I, I, he didn't make the sunrise, he didn't make the trees, he hates the light of the um, the sun and moon, or, or, or as they will be, um, he uh, hates the Noldor and what they craft, but he wants them, he cannot, he needs to be master of things outside himself, and uh, remember this is, I've talked about this, the point of Bombadil and Lord of the Rings, he is master of himself, and that is the first and most important mastery. He really wants to destroy Feanor and end the friendship of the Valar and the Elves. 
He found some ears that would heed him and tongues that would enlarge what they'd heard, and his lies passed from friend to friend. Bitterly did the Noldor atone for the folly of their open ears in the days that followed after. <clears throat> He's still walking among them free, though, and he tells them that they should go back to Middle-earth, because they could do so many things and the Valar are choking them. Uh... And the elves don't know about men. Manwe does, but no one else really knows. And Melkor says the men are going to come and they're going to supplant or destroy you. And so the peace of Valinor is poisoned. It's interesting. He, he hates Fëanor above all lust for the Silmarils, but these he was not suffered to approach for. Though at great feasts Fëanor would wear them, blazing on his brow. At other times they were guarded close, locked in the deep chambers of his horde and Tyrion. For Fëanor began to love the Silmarils with a greedy love, and grudged the sight of them all to save his father and his seven sons. He seldom now remembered that the light within them was not his own. Uh, again, this thing of possession, the need for possession outside yourself. The light of the trees is not Fëanor's. The jewels are things he made, though the skill was not um, invented by him. It was granted to him, as it were, as a gift by Eru. Uh, but he, uh, the thing he has created is actually a shared asset. And it will become a shared memory of something that's lost. Fingolfin and Feanor uh, begin to fall out. And um, Feanor makes weapons. Uh, there is now real, real strife uh, within, uh, within this place. Um, Fingolfin does somewhat cause trouble um, by saying to his father he has to restrain the pride of Curafinwe, I Feanor, and they clash and uh, now the Valar uh, see what's going on but they don't really know, they're like well if they want to depart, you know if this clash is happening they want to go and do something else, well we can't, you know, this is because Feanor wants to, uh, or at least partial banishment, this banishment to the north, um, then uh, they're not going to stop them. But it ends with Finway, uh, well, rather with Fëanor and his sons, and Finway, who cannot bear to be parted from uh, his firstborn son, going to the north to form Manos, where um, there's a multitude of gems and the Silmarils. And this will continue to be important throughout the books. Melkor has been exposed now. Tolkus seeks for him in vain. Uh, but um, there is a thing where Melkor uh, tries to convince Fëanor, this I've already mentioned, and Fëanor was still bitter, and so he's wondering, you know, if he might yet trust Melkor uh, so far as to aid him in his flight. Melkor pushes too far, his cunning overreached his aim, and Fëanor looked upon Melkor with eyes that burned through his fair semblance and pierced the cloaks of his mind, perceiving there his fierce lust for the Silmarils. Then hate overcame Fëanor's fear, and he cursed uh, Melkor and bade him be gone. Get thee gone from my gate, thou jail crow of Mandos. And he shut the doors of his house in the face of the mightiest of all the dwellers in Ea. And Finway, knowing trouble is, is coming, sends messengers. Uh, there's something there, Fëanor... This is not a character. This is there's one thing we discussed again in our, on the Discord is there's real depth to these characters. Feanor um, and mor moral complexity, and there is in Lord of the Rings. It's, it's simply wrong to say there's not. I mean, surely Gollum and Frodo, uh, Thorin Oakenshield, um, Theoden and Denethor, Boromir. These are genuinely uh, uh, very complex characters, and there are others. You know, there are characters who go on arcs and develop as well. Uh, but Feanor is, in the poetic sense, a heroic character. He refuses to compromise with um, an evil being, but there's two motives in his heart. One is this greed, and the other is the genuine purity of genius. Not a, not a moral virtue of not liking bad guys, but some sort of actual a refusal to uh, descend to deal with uh, such a disgusting creature essentially um that uh, uh he is this uh, sl uh slinking creature melkor has become a pathetic disgusting creature despite all his 
seeming beauty and might. And um, Feanor uh, hates that enough that he will slam the door in the face. Melkor departed from Valinor for a while. The two trees shone again unshadowed and the land was filled with light. Uh, but the Valar sought in vain for the tidings of their enemy, and as a cloud far off that looms ever higher, borne upon a slow cold wind, a doubt now marred the joy of all the dwellers in a man, dreading they knew not what evil yet might come. And the evil is the darkening of Valinor, which is quite a short chapter, which consists of Melkor um, coming to a, a, a far region, uh, to the south of the Bay of Eldemar, um, and... Uh, he finds, uh, it's, it's there, isn't it? He finds a creature called Ungoliant. He, even he's scared of Ungoliant. Is Ungoliant a Maya? Is Ungoliant an offspring of the music in some sense? Um, of the discord of the music, perhaps? Uh, the dissonance? We don't know. Ungoliant is an unclear thing. Descended from Ungoliant will be Shelob um, in The Lord of the Rings. So Ungoliant is the mother of spiders. Whether she is precisely a spider, she she in a ravine she lived and took shape as a spider of monstrous form. Uh, she sucked up all light she could find. She's not a spider biologically, but there is a spiderliness about her. Um, and the great spiders of Middle Earth seemingly are her, her actual offspring and creation. Melkor came to Avatar, sought her out. He put on again the form he had worn as the tyrant of Atumno. A dark lord, tall and terrible. In that form he remained ever after. And they plot their revenge. Finally, Melkor. The seeming was his last chance of actually of actual redemption. Um, much like perhaps for a time Sauron did repent and take a fair form, but then fell again. Um, whatever the case is, Melkor, uh, when he gives up that form, cannot again achieve a form of beauty. Um, he is uh yeah his corruption is too deep and corruption does not lead to and rebellion does not lead to more freedom more liberation but to less in this context and goliant unto the purpose of melkor she is torn between lust and great fear for she is loath to dare the perils of a man and the power of the dreadful lords and melkor says do as i bid and if thou hunger uh, still when all is done then i will give thee whatever thy lust may demand yea with both hands lightly he made this vow as he ever did, and he laughed in his heart. Thus did the great thief set his lure for the lesser. And Ungoliant set, creates a cloak of unlight so they can hide. And goes to Hyarmentia, the tallest mountain in the southern part of the world, far south of Great Tanakatil. And they sneak in, make ladders of woven ropes, which are, I suppose are from her silk. And they see... Um, they see Valinor and uh, Melkor laughs and they come at the time of festival and the Valar are dressed in the form of the children of Iluvatar. Uh, Yavanna set time for the flowering the ripening of all things and each first gathering they had this festival. The basis of human festivals uh, now in Tolkienian terms of Middle Earth comes from this, uh, from the fact that even at the beginning whenever things fruited they'd have a festival to celebrate it. The Vanyar, the Noldor, the Maya, they sang, come together, they sang before Manwe and Varda. Only the Teleri beyond the mountains still sang upon the shores of the sea, for they wrecked little of seasons or times, and gave no thoughts to the cares of the rulers of Varda, or the shadow that had fallen on Valinor, for it had not touched them as yet. Not significant. One thing only marred the design of Manwe. Feanor came indeed, for him alone Manwe had commanded to come. But Finway came not, nor any of the others of the Noldor of Formenos. For said Finway, While the ban lasts upon Fëanor, my son, that he may not go to Tyrion, I hold myself unkinged, and I will not meet my people. Fëanor comes, he doesn't bring the Silmarils, uh, but he's reconciled to Fingolfin in word, um, and Fingolfin releases him from the threat that Fëanor had made him previously, and then Fingolfin makes a mighty vow, a mighty and... and Doom laden vow. Half brother in blood, full brother in heart will I be. Thou shalt lead and I will follow. May no new grief divide us. I hear thee, said Fëanor. So be it. But they did not know the meaning their words would bear. Because even at that point, it is told, 
and both she, trees were shining there, holding their hands. At that very hour, shadow falls. The unlight rose up even to the roots of the tree. Melkor, with his black spear, smote each tree to its core, wounded them deep, and their sap poured forth as if it were their blood and was spilled upon the ground. Again, incredibly tight description. Ungoliant sucks it up. She sets her black beak to their wounds. She's a foul creature. The poison of death that was in her went into their tissues, withered them root, branch, and leaf, and they died. And still she thirsted, thirsted and going to the wells of Varda, she drank them dry. Um, and she sort of shaped so vast and hideous, Melkor was afraid. Great darkness falls, the light fails, the darkness that follows no more than loss of light. In that hour was made a darkness that seemed not lack, but a thing with being of its own, for it was indeed made by malice out of light. And it had power to pierce the eye, and to enter the heart and mind, and strangle the very will. And Valmar is foundering in a deep sea of night. It's uh, the shadow soaring up, and uh, the holy mountain stands alone. Disaster struck. It blows, blows chill from the east. Uh, Manway pierces through the night, and sees the darkness moving, and the pursuit is up. Arome the, are riding on Naha with hooves of fire and um, they, they're they scattered whenever they're on, with a cloud of uh, ungoliant. Uh, Tulkus is one caught in a black net at night and he said powers and beat the air in vain. But when the darkness had passed it was too late. Melkor had gone whither he would and his vengeance was achieved. Um, it's very dramatic, it's very efficient. Uh, we have particularly strong characterizations of Feanor and Fingolfin actually particularly increasingly. Fingolfin uh, doesn't get why his brother is like he is. Fingolfin doesn't have the lofty spirit of his brother. Uh, hence why he sees Feanor's words as madness. He doesn't get what's happening. Uh, we see Finway, this man broken by grief uh, in a way that breaks his son and which breaks the world. Um, all kind of stems really from there in the long run, or at least significantly from there. Uh, we do get the continuation of the character of Melkor now coming to his most debased, um, and now he's going to a stronghold. The only stronghold that's been mentioned that's not destroyed at Tumno is Angband, and Angband will be uh, the great place of his stand on Middle Earth. Uh, but. Um, we have, uh, yes, a, um, a a great disaster, uh, as it turns out. We 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 will find this out that the Silmarils are gone, and uh, the last this last great crime in Valinor causes so much other um, strife and glory. And that's the thing he's particularly good at here is that this is in that sense much more Norse Norse than the Lord of the Rings that. Uh, we are able to thrill and enjoy basically foolish and bad acts. Um, but they're not foolish and bad because it's more complicated than that. You can't simply have a binary of things which are good, things which are bad. It's that there is great glory uh, in the story that is to come. There already was in the creation of the Silmarils by this impure, broken man, Feanor. Um, and there will be great glory in what's to come. But it will all be, also be tinged with tragedy. Um, and uh, the nearest thing there, I guess, you get, and it's very redemptive, but you get, um, the well, said and, and less redemptively, the story of Denethor in Lord of the Rings. Uh, that's that's where we're at with this move to the elves, the characterisation of particularly Feanor, Fingolfin, and, and the others. Uh, we've yet to meet many of our main characters for the next part of the story, uh, We or we've only had them mentioned uh, the children, basically, the grandchildren of Finway are very important. Uh, we've had Thingol mentioned, we haven't had other come up, stuff come up there uh, with the elves who stayed behind in Middle-earth. We're going to move to that next. Um, if you've got thoughts on these chapters, please, please add them, share them uh, in the comments, and I'll see you next time.